Good afternoon, everyone. Um, what an honor it is for me to extend official greetings to each of you at the beginning of this new academic year and to welcome you to our annual university convocation, an institutional tradition for us here at Stony Brook. This year's convocation is particularly meaningful as we celebrate the life, work, and memory of John Sampson Toll, who I believe in some sense was Stony Brook's George Washington, the founding father of the university, serving as its second president, not its first, but its second president from 1965 to 1978. Before I introduce you to a few special individuals who have come to help us celebrate and honor the memory of Dr. Toll, I ask you to join me in recognizing Mrs. Deborah Tainter Toll, Dr. Toll's wife of 40 years, who shared her husband's passion for Stony Brook and contributed significantly to this institution's success during his tenure here. Mrs. Toll, thank you so much for joining us today and for your continued support of Stony Brook University. I want to extend my most sincere gratitude to you for your many years of support for President Toll and for your role in helping this university become the institution that it is today. Also joining us here today to help honor the memory of Dr. Toll are former Stony Brook University President Shirley Strum Kenny and her husband Bob. Richard Gelfond, Chair of the Stony Brook Foundation. John Burness, Visiting Professor of Public Policy at Duke University, who served as Assistant to President Toll. And Robert DeZafra, Professor Emeritus, Department of Physics and Astronomy. Thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedules to join us today. I would now like to give each of our special guests an opportunity to offer a few brief comments about President Toll from their own perspective as a means of celebrating this remarkable man for whom this year's convocation program is dedicated. They will each come forward in the order printed in your program. We will begin with comments from Rich Gelfond, the CEO of IMAX, who was a student during President Toll's time here at Stony Brook. It is a great honor to come here to pay tribute to Dr. John Toll, who in my life is one of three kind of really important mentors and made such a huge difference, it's hard to describe in less than the five minutes allotted to me. Um, just by way of background, today I'm uh, not only chair of the foundation and have been for about a decade, but have been uh, CEO of IMAX Corporation, the entertainment technology company for about 17 years. But it wasn't always that way. Um, when I came to Stony Brook as a 17-year-old, uh, I first met Dr. Toll actually in the president's um, headquarters building when he came out where I was with about 300 other students and told us to um, please evacuate the building before he called the police to arrest all of us. But you know that was kind of a key point. He didn't just go arrest you. He warned you first, and that was an insight of, uh, of, of what was to come. Um, more of my interaction with Dr. Toll actually happened later in my um, education at Stony Brook. When, um, um, as a student, I, I think I was probably a junior, I was the first student elected to the Stony Brook Council, which is like the Board of Trustees, the local Board of Trustees of the university. And I grew up in Plainview. My father was a blue collar worker. He never made more than $20,000 a year. And I really didn't know how professionals really acted and how CEOs worked. But John Toll, when he worked with that board, was really the word mentor. He treated them with such generosity, kindness, humility, compassion. He really was the first one to teach you, you know, the way that a, accomplished professional CEOs and managers um, should behave. And you know, John Burness, who's somewhere over here, I just saw him, was, was there at that time. And he, he knows very well. I mean, these people were a group of very, very people who ran major companies. And, John Toll treated them with such respect and such honor and such intellect, and he just had a soft, kind way about him. And I, from that age, when you're really impressionable, I always thought, gee, if I ever got to that position, you know, that's how I want to behave. That's how I want to be. And then later on, um, I went to law school for, um, after I graduated, and I came back, and I was John's 
assistant to the president for a summer. And he really taught me how to manage. And when he wrote letters, how just not to answer the question, but to put a, a, something funny, to put something kind in there, to take a personal incident and talk about it, to personalize it and not make it just about business and just make it pointed. How to make it special, how to use your personality to make a point and bring out the best in people. And again, that's, it's hard to describe, but it's one of those lessons when you learn young, they stick with you the rest of your life. And those of you who knew John, and I'm sure you'll hear more about the same thing today, he was an innate optimist. I mean, he was the kind of person like you could have a roller coaster, you know, coming down the hill and trying to kill everybody in its way. And he'd say, don't worry, everything's gonna be fine. And that sort of attitude was just, you know, phenomenal. And then the last story I'd like to tell was probably in the last 10 or 15 years, I was at a dinner um, not far from here with Frank Yang, who you know John brought to Stony Brook and made a huge difference. And the three of us were at a table talking, and John and Frank were reminiscing about how they both worked together on the project that led to the development of the hydrogen bomb. I, I, it's, it's not Manhattan Project, many of you know which it was, but it has some name like that. And they were talking about how they used to sneak into the Bureau of Standards after five o'clock at night because the government had left the offices and there was only one computer in the United States strong enough to do the calculations or powerful enough so they could you know, develop what they were working on. And it was just the most amazing thing. It was like being a part of history, you know, listening to the two of them. So not knowing much of what they were saying, I interjected and I said, um, you know, of course in theory, when a, a nuclear explosion goes off, you don't know how long it's gonna go. And, it's only one reason you have um, these computers is so you can understand at what point the explosion will stop. And I said, you know, so were you guys confident that when we tested the hydrogen bomb, it wasn't gonna destroy the world? And John looks at Frank and he looks at me and he goes, pretty confident. <laughs> so anyway, that sense of optimism worked out in that case and in a lot of other cases and I'm just happy to be here. And I think, um, again, in this instance, it's a, really a life to celebrate and a, difference that hopefully the others will help capture. Um, now I'd like to introduce Professor Emeritus of Physics and Astronomy, Robert De Zafra. Good afternoon. Looking around, I see that many of you were probably born about the time that John Toll first came to Stony Brook. Even our esteemed current president was a high school student at that time and still a graduate student at the University of Chicago when John left Stony Brook. So there's a lot to talk about and uh, I'm not going to be able to cover anywhere near as much as there is to say in the appointed time. My friendship with John Toll began 57 years ago in the autumn of 1954 when I became a graduate student in physics at the University of Maryland. I'd enrolled there on the advice of one of my teachers at Princeton where John had been a grad student. Toll had arrived at Maryland only a year before at the age of 29 to become the youngest physics department chairman in any American university. He was already known among Princeton faculty, not only as an excellent student, but also as a capable administrator. Having had the unusual responsibility, while still a graduate student in theoretical physics, of serving as the deputy director of Project Matterhorn, a major new physics research effort then starting up at Princeton. Under government support, it later grew into the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, which was the nation's first effort to explore power production through controlled nuclear fusion. At the University of Maryland, Toll had pitched into the process of building a fine physics department immediately on his arrival. It was a great time to watch how Johnny did it from my lowly perspective as a graduate student. Twelve years later, after Johnny had introduced me to my first wife and after I'd finished my degree, moved on to the University of Pennsylvania and then to Stony Brook, John, with major accomplishments under his belt, was beginning to think of larger things. Let me backtrack a bit. In 1960, the Heald Report, commissioned by Governor Nelson Rockefeller, 
had called for the creation of a public, publicly supported real state university of New York. <clears throat> and that report had switched the mis mission of Stony Brook, then in its earliest stages of planning and construction, from that of a small undergraduate college intended for training high school science teachers to that of becoming one of four major university centers for the state of New York. Alec Pond and others in the self-styled Princeton Mafia had already joined Stony Brook's physics department shortly after the Heald Report set Stony Brook on a new course. Thus, in 1965, and partly on the strength of the Princeton connection, Johnny was persuaded to switch from department chairman at Maryland to president at Stony Brook. I began to see a pattern here when looking over my shoulder. Either I was following John everywhere he went a few years later, or he was beginning to follow me everywhere I went. In any case, after four years of interim leadership without a designated president, it looked like Stony Brook was going to be in for a great ride. Those were, in fact, heady days in New York, <clears throat> which was the last state in the Union to establish a real state university system. Under Rockefeller's prodding, and he was pouring money into the effort in a way that only a Rockefeller would dare to think about. Toll hit the deck running at Stony Brook, quickly established good rapport with Rockefeller, also had a major influence on the entire structure of SUNY's central administration in Albany, which after all had virtually no experience in creating, let alone trying to operate, a major university system. He was soon doing the job of three or four people here and in Albany. Those were also argumentative times on campus. A subgroup of early faculty was still wedded to the small college idea of individualized instruction with a student on one end of a log and the professor on the other and they saw their train veering off the tracks. Toll was soon perceived by others to be only interested in a building spree, full speed ahead and damn the mud, inconvenience and overall disruption. But Johnny could see what others couldn't, that the Rockefeller years were coming to an end and that the state legislature could no longer sustain the outpouring of money needed for new buildings as well as the recruitment of a great faculty. It was a matter of for forging ahead quickly to the front or foundering for decades to come. But it wasn't all just about buildings. Johnny wanted good buildings rather than those like the first round of prison arch architecture that went up on campus. He also saw the need to build large and for the future so that buildings being put up would be ac adequate for the decades to come. He got the dormitory authority to enlist major architects to design new dormitory complexes, such as Kelly and Roosevelt quads, which were modeled of enlightened student dormitories in their day and still are. He put a stop to wholesale bulldozing of forests and hillsides and got new building designs, particularly dormitory quads, that were carefully planned into the landscape and preserved in integrated natural settings. It's a sobering thought that a major fraction of the dormitories and nearly all of the academic buildings and lecture halls in use here at Stony Brook, as well as the hospital and health sciences and research buildings were either built under construction or authorized for construction during the toll years. And it's rather sad that many people, these, <coughs> for, the, for many people, those years are still remembered as the mud years, but there's no other way to get it done and get it done before the money ran out. Those years gave us the heart of both the East and West campuses as they are today, and we would have been frozen into a very much smaller shoe had, Nani, had Johnny not built fast, furiously, and to a large scale. But for John, building was a university meant not just putting up buildings, but also expanding the state's vision of Stony Brook, of recruiting a faculty of excellence in widely diverse fields, bringing in internationally known scholars such as Bentley Glass in biology, the Pulitzer Prize winning Lewis Simpson in poetry and literary criticism, Nobel Prize winner C.N. Yang in physics, and others in many fields to place Stony Brook solidly on the map of serious academic institutions. 
He lobbied for and obtained state approval for adding a teaching and research hospital with its associated medical, nursing, and dental schools and health sciences research. He began the construction of the physical facilities on the East Campus. The student body was enlarged from 1800 when he arrived to 17,000 by the time he left. He saw the need to strengthen the operations and capabilities of the state's research foundation and made it happen. He separately created the local Stony Brook Foundation as a vehicle for endowments and independent funding of Stony Brook's growth. All of this was accomplished in just 13 years. Finally, nearly everything through the, the late 60s and well into the 1970s, the major portion of Toll's time at Stony Brook had to be done to the steadily growing student protests against the Vietnam War and authority in general, and most definitely that of university presidents. Though never truly comfortable at making speeches or at large public gatherings, John Toll handled, John Toll handled students patiently and well, especially compared to the goings on at some other prominent universities. He handled them with an understanding and honesty that was appreciated by <clears throat> even the most troublesome of students. He never lost his temper and he never blew his cool with them. An impatient man himself, he understood their impatience. He was also stubborn, however, and would not give in to what he perceived as nonsense demands by students when he felt they should have known better or when giving in would have harmed the institution. Sensing that it was again time to move on after Stony Brook had grown to a remarkable degree, both physically and in natural, national prominence, Johnny went back to Maryland in 1978 as chancellor to preside over the redesign and rebuilding of a comprehensive state university system for Maryland and to become head of the 34-member Universities Research Association and to perform a variety of other public service at the national level. In 1995, after a year or two of trying retirement, he was asked at the age of 71 to serve as interim president of Washington College, a small, old, and then foundering undergraduate institution on Maryland's eastern shore. I saw him shortly after he'd taken on that task, and he was like a child with a new and delightful toy, literally bubbling with enthusiasm. He did not take interim to mean caretaker, and <clears throat> once again grabbed the tiger by the tail. He so impressed the college's trustees that he was soon made full-time president and in a few short years lifted Washington College out of crippling indebtedness, building new buildings, enlisting new faculty, and more than quadrupling its endowment. Johnny left the presidency of Washington College at age 80, only after a heart surgery had indicated that it was finally time to slow down. In 50 years, he'd gone from one of the nation's youngest department chairman to one of its oldest presidents. During that whole 50 years, it has been noted that Toll worked on so many things at once and for such long hours every day, weekends included, that he sometimes required four secretaries to keep up with the workflow. He often carried two briefcases. He was known for sprinting to meetings and for looking like he'd slept in his clothes, which was probably more often true than not. I'd like to close, close with a quote from Rita Caldwell, former head of the National Science Foundation. <clears throat> he was a visionary who always liked challenges. He never wanted to sit back and let things happen. He wanted to make sure that there was always forward progress. He loved innovation, and was really fun to work with. He was just wonderful. I will miss him so much. Johnny, we will all miss you. Now I'd, I'd like to introduce Shirley Strom Kenny, fourth president of Stony Brook University. When I chaired the Senate at the University of Maryland College Park, 
I spoke as faculty representative at John S. Toll's inauguration when he became chancellor of the Maryland system on April 30th, 1979. He had returned to Maryland where he had been chair of physics after 13 years as president of St excuse me, Stony Brook. It was a day full of hope and excitement. The Nobel Prize winner, C.N. Yang, received one of two honorary degrees, a symbol of the aspirations that the new president brought to the university. Little did we know what we were in for. We had not dreamed that a university could move forward at such a breathtaking pace with Johnny pushing every single step of the way. He had a vision of what Maryland could become and nothing would stop him from realizing that vision. He was a force of nature. So when I followed in his footsteps to become president of Stony Brook 14 years after he had left, I felt as though I already knew the place. Johnny's touch was everywhere. In the aspirations, in the building of the physics and astronomy department as a first step, and his determination to move to greatness faster than anybody had ever managed before. Stony Brook had been created as Long Island's Teachers College. It opened in September 1957. Two weeks later, Sputnik blasted this country out of its complacency and Governor Nelson Rockefeller decreed that the new little teachers college would become a great research university. New York's answer to Berkeley. There was a rapid succession of five chief executives in, in eight years. The one with the title president lasted less than a year before Governor Rockefeller found his man, the leader who would make Stony Brook a reality. Johnny left College Park for Stony Brook and the infant Long Island campus would never be the same. New York's answer to Berkeley was on its way. Johnny's fervor for excellence never wavered. His energy never flagged. The stories of his marches on the halls of state power, undaunted by the legendary dysfunction of the New York government, still reverberate. If Johnny wanted a new building, more faculty, a bigger budget, he was going to get it no matter what. And he wanted a lot. He never doubted that Stony Brook could rapidly become a world-class institution and he would make it happen fast. So look out Albany. And it worked. It took over, he took over a campus of 1,800 students and 240 faculty with two colleges, arts and sciences and engineering, maybe seven buildings, and 13 years later, he left a research institution of 17,000 students and 1,250 faculty with fledgling colleges of medicine, dentistry, nursing, allied health, basic health sciences, and social work. He imported Nobelist Yang from Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study, and he hired Paul Lauterbur, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering MRI technology when he was here at Stony Brook. He built yet another of the finest physics departments in the country. He created an entire campus of academic and research buildings and residence halls, unfortunately all built by the state in what we later less than fondly call neo-penal architecture. But he got those buildings up there with near impossible speed and he got faculty and students into them. He lured some of the brightest, feistiest students of the 1960s to what was still a huge mud puddle, though with buildings on it, and as a consequence, he dealt with drug raids, takeovers of the president's office, tent cities. He more than earned his 1960s badges of honor. Johnny's campus was alive, energetic, rough-hewn, growing at an astonishing rate and attracting the finest minds. 
all the things that he was always noted for. He was a visionary and a builder. He transformed the fledgling Long Island Teachers College into a world-class research university. He did it with inventiveness, drive, and a determination that would not be breached. It was an extraordinary match, an infant campus with unrealized potential, and a man who saw what could be created and had the drive and energy and determination to make it happen. Stony Brook would not be Stony Brook had there been no Johnny Toe. In building that dream, he taught all of us to be strong, persevere, achieve the ultimate, and enjoy every minute of it. Johnny, farewell, my friend. We miss you terribly. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce John Burness, now at Duke, who was Johnny's assistant here. It's wonderful to be back here after such a long period of time. Um, I go far enough back, like Bob DeZafra, that when I was here, Kenneth P. Laval was a staffer on a Senate committee, not the namesake of our uh, athletic facilities here. Um, I first met Johnny in 1970. Um, as Bob said, he took on many jobs. One of them was when he was working on a commission for the future of SUNY that was in uh, Albany. And uh, we met, I think, in Sarasota. And I was struck immediately. I thought he looked like John Glenn, except he had a warmer smile and even warmer eyes. He came over right away, thrust out his hand, and said, hi, I'm Johnny Toll. Um, I came away from that first meeting with him with this overwhelming sense of his intelligence and unbelievable energy, and I immediately liked him. And for the next nine years, to continue the John Glenn analogy, I felt like I was on a rocket taking off. Bob described the famous Heald Commission report, although Bob, you actually got one thing in it that was a little off, which is Heald actually recommended only two major research universities in SUNY Buffalo and Stony Brook. Um, and then, of course, there was a subsequent commission which recommended the creation of a major medical center uh, here. Uh, but the whole idea was that New York State, and this was Nelson Rockefeller driving it, was going to have a great public institution which would do for this state and the nation what Berkeley, Ann Arbor, and Urbana had done for their states and the nation. The reality of the time, as largely as it has been described, Rockefeller was very much in support, made sure a lot of money was coming this way. But as Bob pointed out, that soon was ending, and Johnny understood that. So I wrote down a little context in reality. New York State had no history of political support for either a great public research institution or genuine excellence in its public higher education system for the state. As Bob pointed out, New York was the last of the then 48 states to create a public institution, and that was, I think, in 1948, unless I'm mistaken, under Governor Harriman. By creating four major research universities, it was really going to be hard to get enough money to do what these other states had figured out you needed to do to build a great campus or two. And as has been pointed out, the 70s was an era of protest. Um, I think I first met Rich Gelfond at one of the many demonstrations in our office. We used to categorize them by holidays. There was the pre-Halloween demonstration, there was the post-Halloween demonstration, there was the pre-Thanksgiving one. My favorite was when someone yelled out from the back of the room, hey, Butterball, are you self-basting to me? <laughs> that might have been Gelfon, now that I, uh, I think about it. But, but in this era of protest, it actually complicated the mission that Johnny was trying to do for the place, because the public simply didn't understand what was going on on colleges and universities. And it made it all the more difficult, therefore, to generate the public support and the political support that was needed to create a great institution and nurture it. 
And as Shirley pointed out, New York's lamentable pre-audit, post-audit, most heavily regulated system in the country, a convoluted budget system, uh, and a construction system described as neo-penal. I was actually here when Norman Mailer said that comment about the facilities here look neo-penal and we couldn't figure out what exactly he meant by that second word. Uh, and for those of you who are uh, more recent to understanding Stony Brook, Sarah Palin was not the first person to build a bridge to nowhere. Um, <laughs> And finally, the New York State budget, which was in terrible shape uh, during the 70s. Uh, there were in-year rescissions virtually every year. You never knew how much money you really were going to have to do anything. And this was all the norm. This was the environment in which the Johnny Toll you've heard about was operating. He was totally undaunted by this. At heart, Johnny was a Boy Scout. It was never about him. It was always about the bigger accomplishment and goal. Uh, and in this and his fundamental decency, he really had an amazing set of the best of 19th century values. His eyes always were on the long-term objective. He took the slings and arrows of the presidency as impediments to achieving Stony Brook's greatness, and they were all just part of the cost of doing business. He never took it personally. Hurdles were something to be jumped over. Uh, he told me once when we had been rejected in one of his many building requests um, that, okay, what we have to do is answer their questions. They really never say you can't have it. What they say is we need more information, and in this his partner in crime was Alec Pond. They continually provided more information, and as Johnny pointed out, eventually they get tired and you get what you're seeking. Um, and he turned out to be absolutely right on this. Um, and he was... Um, while he understood the pressures that those within the central administration of SUNY had to deal and the political world had to deal, he was absolutely unrelenting in arguing for Stony Brook's fair share. More than that, often. But while most of us think of Johnny as the builder of all those buildings, as well we should, I watched him in what I thought actually was an even more critical role. Johnny had exceptionally good academic taste and the highest standards. And he understood that in the long run, the great strength of this institution uh, as a research university would be in its faculty. So you've heard the names of the, the stars who were attracted here that he was instrumental in getting. Um, of, of, of true giants who were themselves magnets to other great faculty. But he understood that building and sustaining excellence in the faculty was the long-term key to the excellence of the place. And this was a place that didn't have any tradition because it was so new. Um, and it didn't, in a sense, have the advantages of the Berkeleys and Urbanas and Ann Arbors in having a long tradition built into things like the tenure process. So Johnny inserted himself in that process in ways that I think in most institutions would be found to be uncomfortable that a president was doing so. But I think he understood completely how important this would be to the long-term strength of the institution. Um, I, I watched him. He had one person on his staff who did virtually nothing but read tenure files, summarize different issues, and give whatever questions surfaced to Johnny. And then Johnny would read the entire file. Um, he then would pick up the phone, call the very best people in the field uh, of the particular faculty member, and the general question was, is this truly one of the best people in the country? Is this someone you would consider giving tenure to? Um, by doing that and by holding to that kind of standard, he forced that back into the system. And the end result is a... Is a um, is a faculty of extraordinary talent today, built on a, a whole set of very high standards he set. I recall one particular incident with one faculty member who was, I would say, at best, one of Johnny's great antagonists in the faculty. And I said to him, he's up for tenure. What do you think? Are you going to give it to him? I was 25 years old. What the hell did I know, right? And it didn't occur to Johnny to even think otherwise if the quality of the scholarship was meritorious and the faculty member got tenure. It wasn't even a question in his mind. 
Uh, as Shirley said, the political world has never really seen anything quite like him in New York. He was relentless and so committed to build a great university for New York and Long Island. They eventually began to understand the potential of this place. And they went from being scared of, like hell of uh, his relentlessness to having profound respect for him. Johnny had some interesting personal qualities. Extraordinary intelligence matched by uncommon decency. If Johnny got on an elevator, it didn't matter who was there. He started a conversation with him. It didn't matter if it was the governor or it was somebody who was cleaning the elevator. He was genuinely interested in people. He would never ask anyone to do something he wouldn't do for himself. He was generous in giving credit to others. He was insatiably curious. It was, his wonderment was almost childlike, and he never stopped learning. And he had this indefatigable energy. He was the hardest working person I had ever known. And as Shirley pointed out, he had fun. And we all did too when we were around him. Now, I think we need to be careful not to over-romanticize this guy. Um, I was struck in looking at the uh, slideshow at the beginning, how well decked out he looked. Um, when, of course, Bob captured it best, most of the time he looked like he slept in the clothes he was wearing. When I knew him in my first year, um, his eyeglasses were held together by a safety pin. His ties were inevitably stained. His socks rarely matched. And I hesitate to say this, his fly was frequently open. <laughs> uh, he once said to me, he really didn't pay much attention to the costumes people wear. And that's how Johnny thought about clothes. He took scientific rational thinking to a level I'd never seen before. Uh, NASA had sent out an inquiry to some 700 scientists and others around the country um, in thinking, asking them to think about and advise NASA on the qualities that would be needed um, in astronauts we would be spent sending off into space. And Johnny wrote back that if they could find a legless female midget with at least one child and a PhD in astrophysics, they should go for her. I thought this was one of those rare cases of his odd sense of humor, and he was deadly serious. Johnny had analyzed the question. If it was a midget and legless, the, the size of the capsule would be smaller than needed. If it was someone with at least child, a woman with at least one, one child, they would have a maternal instinct to return. And the idea of a PhD in astrophysics is, is straightforward. I can't imagine how that was received when it arrived <laughs> in Washington. As was pointed out, his own needs were remarkably few. After all, this was a boy who had gone to the Putney School. He didn't fully appreciate the chaos of a campus constantly under construction on students. And what was, to him, sacrifice to achieving a long-term important goal wasn't necessarily seen that way by those slogging through the mud. He was also, and I think this was an ability he'd had I've never seen before or since, the most impressive multitasker ever born. Johnny could go from topic to topic or issue to issue without losing any sense of concentration. Most of us, virtually I would say all of us, I don't know all of you, but I'm going to make a conjecture here. When we're focused on one thing, we're focused on it, and then we kind of come down off that, and then we go back into this another thing, and there's an inevitable drop. There was no drop with Johnny. He had this incredible ability to take on issue after issue after issue and keep a focus and concentration on it was unlike anything I've ever seen. I must point out, it also made him the world's most dangerous driver of an automobile. <laughs> uh, Johnny Bob Nathans, who was the founding dean, I guess, of the uh, Harriman School, and I drove off to see Averill Harriman and his wife Pamela in their home in Westchester to ask Governor Harriman if he would let us name the school after him. Ordinarily, I drove whenever we were going anywhere with Johnny because I actually cherished my own life. And, um, but this one time, Johnny decided he was going to drive, and he just got behind the wheel, and there we were. I got on the back seat, put up the New York Times. I looked in the front seat at one point, and Bob, who was Jewish, was crossing himself. <laughs> and we eventually got to Governor Harriman's, and we had an absolutely wonderful conversation, and the blood had returned to Bob's face. And... Um, as we were leaving, um, and Johnny was shaking hands with Governor Harriman, 
Bob literally ripped the keys out of his hands in front of Harriman. Johnny, of course, didn't notice. He was oblivious to this, and Harriman is looking at what the hell is going on here, you know. Um, one other thing about Johnny as a leader, um, he intentionally surrounded himself with people who would challenge him. He did not like yes people. Sheldon Ackley was the head of ACLU in New York State and later ethical culture. Steve Seitman was Norman Thomas's personal secretary for the last 20 years of his life. And David Dixon was the first black PhD in English, I believe, at Harvard. And then there was me, but that's a different story altogether. Johnny told me two things which have stuck with me all my life and made an enormous difference. He was an extraordinary mentor without even knowing it sometimes. One of them, always shoot for number one because if the, you fail, you might make two. So why bother shooting for 10 and getting 11? That's a pretty interesting thing for someone 25 years old to hear. And the other was 99 times out of 100, doing the right thing is the right thing to do. Don't be afraid to do it. That was Johnny Toll. Stony Brook's rise to the level of an AA university roughly 50, in roughly 50 years is an extraordinary achievement. As my friend Penny Strachbein commented today, Johnny put in place the bones on which the future generations have built this place. Um, what I would say is, if you really want to seek Johnny Toll's monument, you only need to look around. That was wonderful. Um, please join me in thanking all of our speakers. That was As I mentioned in my announcement to the university community a few weeks ago regarding the passing of Dr. Toll, um, I sincerely regret not having had the opportunity to personally meet him. Um, I feel that, obviously, even more uh, after what we've just heard. Um, he obviously had a transformative approach to leadership. And the great vision that he had for Stony Brook to realize its potential as a world-class institution, I think, lives with all of us today. Um, truly, his impact, I think, on this university cannot be underestimated. And I wanted to just say one thing uh, about his commitment to excellence. Um, we've heard already today about his efforts to recruit C.N. Yang. And I want to read from a letter that C.N. Yang wrote to us, uh, a brief part of it, uh, about his interactions with John Toll. Uh, Dr. Yang writes, on one day in the spring of 1965, I received a call from John Toll, who said he had just accepted an appointment as the president of a new campus at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. He wanted me to join him to make Stony Brook a major research-oriented state university, quote, the Berkeley of the East. I had always liked Toll's open and dynamic personality, they'd known each other at Princeton, and admired his leadership talents. I thought Stony Brook had chosen well to appoint him to lead the campus, but I and my family were happy at Princeton and had prospered in the ivory tower-like atmosphere of the Institute. Should I leave Princeton against the advice of many of my close friends to follow John in an entirely new career? It was a difficult decision, but it turned out to be one of the major important decisions in my life. I accepted John's offer and spent the next 33 years at Stony Brook. I am grateful to John for having the insight that I could fit into his vision of the development and growth of a major research university and for all the help and advice he has given me or he gave me during my lifetime. With a similar sense of gratitude, I wish to formally acknowledge this institution's deep, appreci deep appreciation for Dr. Toll's vision for this university. Again, please join me. Before I acknowledge the presence of our new faculty and senior staff, I would like to take a few moments to briefly recognize a group of other individuals who lend their constant support in the way of service to this great public university. Assemblyman Steve Engelbright. Steve, please rise. <laughs> Assemblyman Mike Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Members of the Stony Brook Council, Lou Howard. Frank Trotta, and members of the Alumni Executive Committee, Scott Middleton, the President, 
Gloria Snyder, past president. Sherry Sussman, president-elect. And Robert Stafford, treasurer. One of the most exciting uh, aspects of today's convocation for me is having the honor of welcoming and presenting to the university community our, the newest additions to our faculty. I am pleased to announce that this year we have 66 new faculty members. We have done our best to include each of their names in today's program. As they stand as a group, please help me to greet them with a warm Stony Brook University welcome. Please stand. As new faculty members here at Stony Brook, you join the ranks of some of the world's most distinguished teachers, scholars, and academic leaders. It's not just bragging when we tout the outstanding quality of the faculty who call Stony Brook University home. Our faculty are nationally and internationally known, and the quality of the graduates they help produce is second to none. With more than 14,000 faculty and staff members affiliated with Stony Brook University, you have joined a proud institutional family that is committed to academic excellence and dedicated to professional service. I would like to take a moment to specially recognize two of our new faculty members, Dr. Crystal Fleming and Dr. Serene Cotter, who are joining us this year as Faculty Diversity Program Award winners through the SUNY Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. If you're here, please stand. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fleming, who is joining the Department of Sociology, received her PhD in 2011 from Harvard University. Her research is focused on African-American identity and anti-racism in the United States, and she will be adding to our academic efforts in the areas of race, ethnicity, and immigration. Dr. Cater received her PhD in philosophy in 2008 from Stony Brook University. Her research focuses on women's empowerment in cross-cultural contexts, and she brings expertise on human rights, transnational feminism, and global justice to Stony Brook. I think it's important that you know that fostering an environment which supports diversity is not just a SUNY commitment, it is one that Stony Brook genuinely embraces as well. I am proud to say with a sizable international and ethnic minority student population, as well as employees who range in age from 18 to 82 and hail from more than 100 countries and all 50 states, Stony Brook is proud of its commitment to diversity. At this point, I'd also like to take the time to welcome some of the newest members of the university's leadership team. The individuals that I will introduce have had to hit the ground running in their new roles here at the university, and I might add that they've been doing an outstanding job. As most of you know, just before the end of the spring semester, our former provost, Eric Kaler, left to become president of the University of Minnesota. While so many of us had mixed emotions about Eric's departure, we recognize what a wonderful opportunity it was for him to return to Minnesota, where he will celebrate his inauguration, and, and I'll be there, um, tomorrow. After a very successful national search, we are pleased to present you today our new Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Dennis Asanis and his wife, Helen. Dennis, please stand. <laughs> Helen as well. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Asanis, who will also serve as Vice President for Brookhaven Affairs, will officially join us on October 3rd. Although you may have already read about him in my campus announcement related to his appointment, since he's here today, I just thought I would briefly mention that he is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and holds four degrees from MIT, including three master's degrees and a PhD in power and propulsion. A distinguished scholar, teacher, and leader, Dennis comes to us from the University of Michigan and is widely recognized for his outstanding work in the field of energy, particularly in the automotive arena. Dennis, we're so thrilled that you and Helen could join us today. And we look forward to extending a more formal welcome to you and your family when you arrive in October. In the meantime, I want to thank Dr. Nancy Squires, who had just been named the new Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences prior to our last convocation for outstanding work as interim provost. I would also like to thank Dr. Axel Dries, who has been serving as interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences while Nancy has been at the helm of the provost office. Axel, thank you. Other new additions to the Stony Brook University community leadership team since our last convocation include Dr. ming Wa Zheng, who will be dean of the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Dr. Manny London, Dean of the College of Business. 
Ms. Elaine Crossan, Vice President for External Relations. Dexter Bailey, Vice President for Advancement. Chris Kielt, Chief Information Officer. Ken Dill, Founding Director of the Lewis and Beatrice Lawfer Center for Physical and Quantitative Biology. And Vincent Yang, Chair of the Department of Medicine. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the pending departure of Ms. Carol Kane Gray, our Vice President for Finance and Administration, who will soon be leaving us to take on the new role as Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We are extremely grateful for Carol's service to Stony Brook, which extends more than 30 years. Carol, we will miss you and wish you all the best in your new role. Finally, I can't help but think back to this segment of my address during last year's convocation in which I recognized former Stony Brook University President Dr. Jack Marburger as our newly appointed Vice President for Research. As you know, Jack passed away a little more than two months ago, and we had a memorial celebration in his honor this past Friday. Jack's contributions to this university, and more recently to our research enterprise, will long be remembered, and he will be sorely missed among his colleagues and within the research community. When John Toll came to Stony Brook University as its second president in 1965, only three years after the campus had opened here, he came with an unreserved vision for change that would forever alter the course of this institution and set it on a track to becoming a state and national leader in higher education. At the time, we had only 2,800 students, nine graduate programs, and 18 buildings. It was not only a period of great growth, but also the beginning of our commitment to excellence as our fledgling campus began to attract the likes of world-renowned biologist Bentley Glass as the university's first distinguished professor and academic vice president, C.N. Yang as the Einstein professor of physics, and a 30-year-old Jim Simons to create a world-class mathematics department. The university that you see today has come a long way and continues to flourish on some of the fundamental principles of excellence that were established under President Toll and the other outstanding leaders of this young but vibrant institution. I'm extremely proud to carry the torch of this esteemed university as its president because I believe, like others before me, that we are destined for a level of academic prominence and student success beyond where we are today. I want to begin by talking about our new students. I know that you expect to hear this every day, and I never get tired of saying it because so far it's been true, but Stony Brook University continues to attract better and better students each year. Once again, our freshman class ranks among the best in our institutional history. Almost 27,000 first-year students applied for a class of approximately 2,500 freshmen. And this year, we accepted only 39% of those who applied. As one indicator of the increasing quality of our students, the SAT scores of regular admitted Stony Brook freshmen have continued to improve dramatically over the past decade. Preliminary data shows that the scores of this year's class are 16 points higher than those of last year's students. And we have witnessed an increase of nearly 100 points in our freshman SAT scores since the year 2000. The ethnic and geographical diversity of our incoming class of students is outstanding. According to admission records, 32% of our freshmen are Asian, which equals our population that identify themselves as white. 9% are Hispanic, 9% are of other international origin, and 5% are black. The remaining percentages include students of two or more ethnicities or are unknown. Additionally, the number of out-of-state freshmen increased to 21% from 18% last year, an important marker for Stony Brook. While our performance in this area has been outstanding, we will be facing new challenges and continuing to attract the best and brightest students to Stony Brook University. The number of high school students in New York State and the nation will be declining significantly over the coming decade, so competition will increase for the best students. I will be working with our new provost, Dennis Asanas, the vice president for student affairs, Peter Bajent, Matt Whalen, our associate provost for admissions and financial aid, and Bill Ahrens, dean of international studies, as we make a significant investment in new recruitment initiatives designed to target outstanding high school students in selected regions in the US and be abroad. Along with taking pride in the quality of our students, we are also extremely proud of our faculty and the distinction that they bring to this institution. I'm proud to take a few moments to share with you just a few of the noteworthy accomplishments of our faculty that have occurred since our last convocation. If any of these individuals are present, I ask that you stand when I call your name. 
Dr. John Milner, Professor of Mathematics and co-director of the Institute for Mathematical Sciences, was awarded the $1 million Abel Prize for Mathematics by the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters for pioneering discoveries in topology, geometry, and algebra. Dr. Agnes Weyen He, Sachiko Murata, and Jeffrey Siegel were chosen from among a group of almost 3,000 candidates as 2011 Guggenheim Fellows. Currently Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies, Dr. He is Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics and Asian Studies. Dr. Murata is Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Program in Japanese Studies. And Dr. Siegel is a SUNY Distinguished Professor in the Department of Political Science. Stony Brook professors Jorge Benash, Jessica Gurevich, and Dmitry Karziv were recognized early in the spring of 2010 as American Association for the Advancement of Science Fellows. Dr. Benash is chair of the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology and director of the Center for Infectious Diseases. Dr. Gurevich is professor and chair in the Department of Ecology and Evolution, and Dr. Karziv is professor of physics and astronomy and a prominent scientist at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Dr. Alfredo Fontanini, an assistant professor in neurobiology and behavior, was named by President Obama as the recipient of a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, PCAS, the highest honor given by the U.S. government to science and engineering professionals in early stages of their independent research careers. Dr. Danny Bluestein, professor of biomedical engineering, was awarded a five-year $7.5 million grant by the National Institutes of Health. This award marks the first time a Stony Brook professor received a phase two quantum grant by the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, a division of the NIH. And finally, Dr. Balaji Sitherman, Assistant Professor of Biomedical Engineering, was a 2010 recipient of the NIH Director's New Innovator Award. Only a select group of early career biomedical researchers nationwide received this award, which includes a five-year $1.5 million grant. There is no question in my mind that our faculty continue to be the core strength of this institution. A challenge going forward is going to be our need to recruit and retain outstanding faculty members even when our resources are limited, and I will address this in more detail in just a second. Let me talk a little bit about our budget. When Dr. Toll assumed the presidency at Stony Brook, our state budget was approximately $7 million. We had 253 faculty, about 530 staff members, and research activity was at about $878,000. By the time President Toll left in 78, the state budget had increased by 12 times to 86.5 million. Research activity had jumped to more than 21 million. The university had four times more faculty, six times more staff, nearly 16,000 students, and 35 graduate programs. This is remarkable growth, as we've heard, and an amazing testament to Dr. Toll and all who aided him in these early days. Stenberg University's total budget today is about $2.1 billion of which 1.4 billion is associated with our medical center complex and the remaining 700 million on this side of Nichols Road. Of our total budget, about 295.1 million comes in the form of state allocation, which is made up of 147.5 million in the form of state tax support and about 147.6 million from tuition and miscellaneous revenue. These figures do not count monies that come from the state to support our fringe benefit costs. While $295 million would seem like a significantly higher than the $86.5 million we had 33 years ago, I will point out that if one accounts for inflation, um, we actually had more buying power in 1978 than today. Last year I spoke about our tremendous budget challenges, and unfortunately the state's fiscal crisis led to even more cuts this year. As shown in the next slide, we've now had to deal with more than $82 million in cuts over the past four years, a cut of nearly 27% in our state support. We have coped by aggressively pursuing cost savings, reducing adjunct faculty, consolidating programs, freezing and reviewing staff hiring, using statewide local developed voluntary separations programs, and implementing shared services. We continue to make significant progress towards our goal, developed as part of Project 50 Forward and the Bain Engagement, to reduce our non-academic spending by $27 million annually. But these cost-cutting efforts have come at a price in terms of fewer class sections, larger classes, and we can't forget that our efforts to improve administrative efficiencies have led us to make an already lean organization even leaner, with those remaining shouldering even more of the work effort. We've worked very hard to avoid layoffs, and I'm very grateful to all of our faculty and staff who have risen to the occasion, who have been willing to take on more to keep Stony Brook moving forward. I know you know that what we do at Stony Brook really matters, and I'm proud of each and every one of you and your unique and vital contributions to this university. But as everyone knows, despite these severe cuts, our budget picture today looks far brighter than it did last year. This year, Stony Brook University and all of our supporters helped lead the fight for something historic 
New York SUNY 2020. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out Steve Engelbride and Mike Fitzpatrick and their support for this, and particularly Steve, thank you so much. This groundbreaking legislation contains the first five-year tuition plan in state history and will allow the four-year university centers to charge an academic excellence fee in recognition of their higher cost to educate. It will allow us to initiate annual increases in out-of-state tuition and to receive $35 million in capital for a project of our choice. Within the New York SUNY 2020 Act is also the commitment by the legislature and the governor to work to avoid further cuts to SUNY's budget, which would counter the effects of this tuition increase. The New York SUNY 2020 Act, simply put, is a game changer. For the first time, we know our future revenue and we can engage in long-term fiscal planning. We achieved recognition and support for the higher cost of educating a student at a research institution. And we will use the capital funds to help us build a new state-of-the-art translational medical research building on the East Campus. This building we're calling the MART will be a 250,000 square foot, eight level building that will house 25 cancer research labs, a 30 room cancer clinic, a 300 seat auditorium, and new classroom space. We think this building will be transformative for Stony Brook University in our region, helping us to recruit new researchers in cancer and imaging, and helping our physicians and staff provide better clinical care for cancer patients. Before I leave this topic, there are two critical points I wanna make about New York SUNY 2020 and Stony Brook University. Our intention is to use much of the increased revenue from tuition and fees to directly benefit students by hiring more than 250 new faculty and 800 new staff. More faculty means smaller classes, more class sections, helping students get the classes they need to graduate on time, and more research opportunities for our students. However, while we will receive significant increases in our revenue from tuition and fees under this plan, those increases will not offset the cuts we have received to our base budget until about the fifth year of this tuition plan. So we will achieve our faculty hiring goals only if we are successful in dealing with the ongoing effects of prior year budget cuts by continuing to reduce administrative costs, increasing revenue from other sources, or obtaining an increase in state allocation. The second point is about access. We have made the decision that these tuition increases, while modest, will not affect the ability of the state's most economically disadvantaged students to attend Stony Brook University. Among all of the 64 SUNY schools, only Stony Brook will completely cover the TAP gap, the difference between the tuition increase and the maximum provided by the state's tuition assistance program for New York students with family incomes of $75,000 or less. Why are we doing this? Because we believe that access to quality education is the heart of what we do. Because we are proud of that we have the second highest proportion of economically disadvantaged students in the AAU. And because it's the right thing to do. New York SUNY 2020 provides us with a tremendous opportunity to stabilize our finances and resume our positive trajectory. But as I have emphasized, it will not be enough to help us achieve the truly top tier status, the Berkeley of the East that John Toll envisioned in the 70s and I see on our horizon today. So what do we need to do? I just wanna point out five things that I think we need to do. First, we have to do a better job of obtaining philanthropic support for the university. Fundraising, support from our alumni and friends is absolutely vital to our future. We have a wonderful group of supporters, individuals who have truly transformed this university. And I know we are grateful to all of them for believing in this university and what we do. But we need to do even more in this realm. We have a tremendous advantage as a state school. The money donors give us does not need to go to help keep the lights on, the state does that. Instead, it can go to directly helping us achieve excellence, investing in recruiting and retaining the best faculty by creating an endowed professorship. Providing a scholarship so an outstanding undergraduate or graduate student can attend Stony Brook and devote themselves full time to their studies. Providing an endowment to ensure that a critical academic program or institute will remain relevant and vital for years to come. Or creating a new landmark on our campus, whether a recreation building for our students or a laboratory where new discoveries are made. Coming from a private institution, I know how essential fundraising is for any university. We need to improve our efforts, and with Dexter Bailey in place, I'm committing significant new investments in advancement. We are developing a strategy to better engage our alumni, to do a better job in telling our story, and to better identify and create programs of excellence and distinction that merit support. Stony Brook faculty are doing amazing things on this campus and around the world in academics, research, healthcare, community service, and athletics. And we will work tirelessly to raise the funds to help support their efforts to achieve excellence and impact. Second, we must improve our sponsored research support. 
In 2009-10, for the first time, Stony Brook surpassed $200 million in sponsored research expenditures, and we ranked among, first among SUNY's 64 campuses in research expenditures. But this figure was increased by one-time funds from the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act era, and as these funds phase out in 2011, our dollars have decreased. As everyone knows, this is shaping up to be an extraordinarily difficult time for our funding agencies, National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Energy, the Department of De Defense, etc with budget reductions dominating the current climate in Washington. Monday, I was at an advisory meeting for one of the major institutes of the National Institutes of Health, and they are preparing for the possibility of very significant reductions in their funding dollars. So growing or even maintaining sponsored research support in this environment is going to be very challenging. Nevertheless, I believe we have real opportunities. We still have not fully leveraged our partnerships with Brookhaven National Laboratory and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and this must be a high priority for us moving forward. One area of particular interest is imaging. Human beings are visual creatures, and seeing is critical to understanding. Microbiology depended upon the discovery of the microscope. Astronomy uh, was uh, moved forward by the telescope. And today's structure-based drug design really come from a uh, technique called X-ray crystallography. The building of the National Synchrotron Light Source II at Brookhaven National Laboratory and the continuing advances in PET MRI and other imaging modalities provide us with unique opportunities in this realm. I've committed significant resources to exploring a new imaging initiative that is designed to bring together scientists on this campus, and by that I mean both sides of Nichols Road and at Brookhaven National Laboratory to push the frontiers of research in several areas. Under Ken Kashansky's leadership, our first phase is focusing on neuroimaging, looking at the brain, not just its anatomy, but really how it functions at the molecular and cellular level. More initiatives will follow, and we will work to create a new imaging institute can, that can serve as a focal point pun intended, um, for collaborations between Brookhaven National Laboratory and Stony Brook in this vital area. We're also working with Brookhaven National Laboratory to revitalize our Joint Photon Sciences Institute, an effort designed to position Stony Brook better to utilize the extraordinary capabilities of NSLS2. We also have tremendous opportunities in energy research. Our new advanced energy center should be the center of collaborative efforts with BNL and other partners on issues like the smart grid, on improved storage devices, and on renewable energy sources. We have strengths in a number of these areas, but we're going to need to build critical mass if we're going to be competitive for major awards. We also have the opportunity to grow our efforts in marine and atmospheric sciences. The expansion of our marine research station at our Southampton campus represents just one part of a strategy to increase our research portfolio in this vital area. I want to mention just one more thing in the research realm. Stony Brook University will be a founding member of the New York Genome Center a sequencing and bioinformatics center designed to serve the top scientific and metal research, medical research institutions in the city and to compete with the best sequencing centers, the Broad Institute, Baylor, and Washington University for large-scale sequencing projects. It will also be designed to provide affordable sequencing for hospitals and clinical needs. More details will be forthcoming, but this new genome center may be a tremendous resource both for research and for clinical care at Stony Brook University. These are just a few examples of opportunities, but each will require some level of investment, including strategic faculty recruitment. But I believe the potential returns for Stony Brook, our region, and our nation are significant. Third, we must grow our international efforts. We must be able to recruit outstanding students and faculty from abroad. We must provide better international opportunities for our students, and we must have access to international research and academic collaborations. This is one area that will require investment, but also real focus in the research and service areas. Obviously, there are opportunities everywhere. There are opportunities, of course, around the world. But we must identify those programs where we can create the scale necessary to actually make a difference. We have some signature international programs already, Turkana Basin Institute, our efforts in Madagascar, and our new SUNY Korea initiative, ones that have tremendous potential and can really help differentiate us from other universities. And one of my highest priorities over the next year is going to be make sure that our current programs are the best that they can be. Fourth, we must renew our commitment to providing an outstanding learning and student life experience on our campus. Our new classrooms and planned IT infrastructure improvements will be important first steps, but we also must find ways to improve our content delivery and to reward faculty who develop innovative ways to help our students learn. Our new provost has a particular interest in online learning, and I'm looking at him to take a lead in helping us develop groundbreaking initiatives in this area. To state the obvious, today's students simply learn differently and gather information differently than we did, and we have to adapt. Academics are paramount, but the safety and well-being of our students will continue to be my highest priority, and we will do everything we can to make this a welcoming and supportive environment for each and every member of the Stony Brook community. 
our new recreation center, plans to remodel the student union, our outstanding athletics program under the direction of Jim Fiore, and the wonderful offerings at the Stoller Center are all integral parts of our commitment to our students and our community to make Stony Brook University a vibrant recreation and cultural center. We have come a long way since the days of Mudville and the bridge to nowhere, but we are not resting on our laurels. There is much more to do. <laughs> Finally, we must be strategic. We will have the opportunity to hire new faculty and staff. We will have the opportunity to increase our enrollment, but we will need to make significant, and we will need to make significant infrastructure investments. But we will have to do this again in a relatively scarce resource environment. We will not be able to hire new faculty for every department. We will not be able to fund every center and institute that is proposed. This is where the strategic plans you've developed will be critical. They will help provide the template for this effort. And since things always evolve, we will also be looking for new ideas from faculty, departments, and schools for how to best invest in the future. We need to develop areas of excellence, areas of differentiation for Stony Brook in the arts, in the humanities, in the social sciences, and in the natural, life sciences, natural and life sciences. This will be a challenging task and will involve difficult choices. But how wonderful it will be to talk about growing programs instead of cutting them. I want to conclude by thanking you all for your attendance, by again thanking each of our speakers for their eloquent tributes to John Toll, and by once again paying tribute to that remarkable man who moved us forward so fast, yet so well. Thank you. Thank you.